Hi, I'm here at Kranji Beach, which is in northwest Singapore. And it was near here in February 1942 that the Japanese first landed and commenced their invasion. Across Singapore, there are echoes of the battles and occupation. But before we take a look at those, here's a brief overview of some of the key events in the battle for Singapore. At the end of 1941, the Japanese army invaded Malaysia. It was to mark the start of a quick, decisive victory, ultimately capturing Singapore. The Japanese immediately started to bomb the island, and Japanese fighters sank the only two significant British naval ships in the area. The invading force made quick progress along the Malayan Peninsula, using light tanks and an infantry on bicycles. By the 8th of February 1942, the Japanese crossed the Strait of Johor, targeting the lightly defended northwest rather than the more heavily defended northeast that the British had been expecting. The defence plan had revolved around defending the island to the south. The British, thinking no one would attack from Malaysia, had invested heavily in coastal defences. Large guns equipped with armour-piercing shells deterred a seaborne attack, but the lack of high explosive shells made them ineffective against land-borne troops. Allied air power was also severely diminished. Aging Brewster fighters were hopelessly outdated and many newer hurricanes were destroyed on the ground in air raids. A key airfield at Tenga fell on the 9th of February. On the 11th, after intense fighting, the Japanese took the high ground at Bukit Timur, also seizing control of key Allied supply depots. By the 13th, the Japanese had captured reservoirs and with the water situation now perilous, Allied troops and many civilians concentrated in a three-mile area in the south. On the 14th, Lieutenant General Percival met with the other Allied commanders and, deciding against a counterattack, agreed to surrender. Percival led a small delegation to meet Yamashita, the Japanese commander at the old Ford factory. With little negotiating leverage, Percival agreed to an unconditional surrender. After just over a week, the Battle of Singapore was over and a three-year period of Japanese occupation began. Fort Zalozo is situated on the western tip of present-day Sentosa Island, built in the late 19th century when Singapore had already become an important trading port. Come by sea as we port, so they're firing on the oil installations on Pulambukum. One of 12 batteries, the fort originally formed part of Fortress Singapore at the start of the war. As well as the main guns, the fort was also equipped with smaller six-pounders, anti-aircraft guns and an operational tower. When the Japanese troops invaded, the British had to turn the guns towards the mainland to support the ground defence forces. The original guns were all destroyed by the British themselves around the time of surrender. Today, Fort Solozo is well worth a visit, not only to get a sense of the defences, but also for its exhibition covering the key events of the war and occupation. Hello, I'm here at Bukit Timur, which contains the highest point on Singapore Island. And of course, because of this vantage point, it was a strategic target for the invading Japanese army in 1942. While only 160 metres high, Bukit Timur Hill dominates arterial roads leading into the city. On the night of the 10th of February, Japanese troops, supported by armour, attacked Allied troops here and by the dawn of the 11th of February, the Japanese had seized Bukit Timur and the road to the city was open. Today, Bukit Timur is a peaceful nature reserve and it's also very near the old Ford factory, making it possible to visit both sites in a single day. I'm here at Bukit Chandu in Singapore, which is part of Kent Ridge, and in 1943 was the scene of a last major battle for Singapore, where C Company of the Malay Regiment fought heroically against the invading Japanese. Today this area is a peaceful nature park, but in 1942 it was where one of the last battles for Singapore was fought. The Malay Regiment was first formed by the British in the 1930s as an experimental company. The new regiment quickly proved itself and the unit gained a reputation for its marksmanship. In 1933, an 18-year-old boy named Adnan Saidi joined the army and quickly rose up the ranks to become a lieutenant. 
C Company, consisting of 42 soldiers commanded by Adnan, held a critical part of the British defences at Bukit Chandu. Despite being greatly outnumbered and short of ammunition, the Malay regiment continued to resist the Japanese. Adnan was seriously wounded but refused to retreat or surrender and instead encouraged his men to fight to the end. Soon after, with the whole of Pasir Panjang falling under Japanese control, Adnan, who was badly wounded and unable to fight, was captured. Instead of taking him prisoner, the Japanese tortured and beat him before tying him to a tree and stabbing him to death. The very next day, the British officially surrendered to the Japanese. I'm here at Fort Canning and just behind me is the Battle Box, an underground bunker that was used by the British commanders in the closing stages in the Battle for Singapore. And in fact, in February 1942, it was here that the decision to surrender to Japan was taken. By the 11th of February, 500 officers were crammed into this small command bunker as the Japanese bombed the central area of Singapore. The decision to surrender was made here by Lieutenant General Percival and senior officers on the morning of the 15th of February. Today, guided tours show the tunnels, the command and communication rooms and where the decision to surrender was taken. It's easy to imagine the stifling conditions and the pressure there must have been as in the final four days of the battle, defeat became increasingly certain. Along with Fort Solozo and the Ford factory, this is probably the best World War II site in Singapore and one of the best preserved. Located near Bukit Timur in central Singapore, the Ford factory was built in 1926. By the 1940s, it was used by the British Royal Air Force to assemble fighter aircraft. It was in the boardroom of this factory where Lieutenant General Percival surrendered to Japanese commander Yamashita. During the afternoon, Percival travelled with his staff officers to negotiate terms for a surrender. However, Yamashita held all of the cards and he forcefully laid down the unilateral terms which Percival had no option but to accept. Today the boardroom remains intact and the newly renovated Ford factory also contains extensive exhibits outlining both the invasion and life during occupation. After the Allied surrender, the Japanese immediately cracked down on suspected anti-Japanese elements in an operation named Suk Ching. Chinese men were ordered to screening centers, including one near here at Hong Lim complex where they were interrogated. Those who did not pass were taken to outlying areas and executed. It's estimated that up to 70,000 perished. Located in the north of the island, the Kranji War Cemetery is the final resting place for many of the Allied combatants in the battle across Malaysia and Singapore. One of the things I find incredibly moving about being here at Kranji is not only the graves of 4,000 troops buried in the cemetery, but also the names of 20,000 troops for whom there was no body and whose memory is merely inscribed on the walls behind me. Of all the graves of heroic men here in Kranji Cemetery, one in particular stood out to me, which is that of Major Ivan Lyon, uh, whose grave is behind me. Major Ivan Lyon was a commander of Operation Jaywick, which in 1943 successfully, and against the odds, sabotaged Japanese shipping in the Singapore Harbour. In 1943, 28-year-old British officer Major Ivan Lyon and an Australian, Bill Reynolds, devised a plan to attack Japanese shipping in Singapore Harbour. In September that year, a team of 14 sailed a disguised fishing boat named Crate from Exmouth Gulf in Australia to Singapore. On the night of the 26th of September that year, 
Six men left the boat and paddled 50 kilometers to a Ford base just outside the harbor. They later paddled into Singapore Harbor and placed limpet mines on several Japanese ships before returning to their hiding spot. The limpet mines sank or seriously damaged seven Japanese ships. After the attack, the commandos waited until the commotion was over, returned to Crete and sailed back to Australia, the mission a resounding success. The team's luck was not to hold though, as the next year a similar operation, codenamed Operation Ramal, was discovered and a total of 13 men, including Major Lyon, were killed during battles with the Japanese or were captured and later executed. I'm on the steps of City Hall where in September 1945, events eventually came around full circle. By this time, following the Allied bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Japanese had surrendered. General Percival was one of the Allied commanders flown to witness the formal Japanese surrender in Tokyo Bay. He was also present when his old foe Yamashita, who had been deployed to the Philippines, also surrendered. Yamashita was later tried for war crimes in Manila. Lord Louis Mountbatten, Supreme Allied Commander of Southeast Asia Command, arrived in Singapore to receive the formal surrender of the Singapore Japanese forces and so bring to an end three and a half years of occupation. The Union flag hoisted outside City Hall was the same flag that had been carried alongside the white flag of surrender at the Ford factory. After the war, Singapore was never to be the same again. Just 20 years later, she gained her independence and under the leadership of Lee Kuan Yew, built a strong, prosperous, independent nation that vowed never to be pushed around again.